this is my number one piece of advice to salespeople is we don't practice enough. The close to me is the easiest part of the sale. Closing is simply asking a question. The best practice on purpose, the rest practice on prospects. We love security, but we hate commitment, mm. right? We love novelty, but we fear change, mm. right? This is the dichotomy of being a human that being. Formal education will make you a living. Self-education can make you a fortune. All right, so wherever you're at right now, whether you're driving down the road and you have a, an appointment with the prospect, or whether you're listening to us right now at the gym and you're wondering about the appointments you have today, or maybe you're in your office listening to us and you're about to call a prospect, or maybe you're about to go into a boardroom meeting to finalize a deal. Right now, probably finalizing that deal on Zoom with everything that's going on. But I want you to stop and think, have you ever wondered, what does it actually take, what does it take, not talking about, what does it take to be a top 1% salesperson in your industry, okay? The salesperson who makes all the money, who gets any promotion they want. In fact, they turn down promotions they don't want. They have all the respect from ownership and management in their company. The salesperson who leads by example because they outsell everyone else. Well, my next guest is gonna help answer that question for you. Let me give you a small taste of this gentleman's background. He is, and this is what I really like, a huge proponent of what Jim Rohn taught, that formal education will make you a living, self-education can make you a fortune. He believes in focusing on the person in salesperson. I love that. He's a grown leader. He's developed a better understanding of what truly drives human behavior. We're going to get into that today. Motivation and long-term success to actually succeed no matter what you sell. If we can make better people, he says, the sales will follow. He loves scaling sales teams. He's built sales teams from startup revenue, zero to 150 reps, revenues from zero to 75 million and counting. And he believes in processes and systems paired with skill development as the code to success. He mentors, he consults early, mid and late stage SaaS companies all across the world, sharing his playbooks and processes for scaling teams successfully. That's the big key, successfully. If there's a book on sales, psychology or influence, he's probably already read it. He's a ferocious learner and is constantly pushing himself and his teams to reach new heights of achievements. Because of his own internal desire to learn and grow, that also gets translated out to his teams with nonstop growth, learning, and coaching. Please welcome to the show, Mr. Kevin Dorsey. He goes by KD. KD, how are you? I'm good, my man. And honestly, the reason I love these shows is just to hear that intro. That's just fun to hear sometimes, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let's do this. You, you love that, man. So, hey, I'm excited to have you on here today. I love talking with sales professionals and sales trainers who actually understand how to use techniques that work with human behavior. Because what I found is that most sales training out there is so old school that it still works against human behavior, triggering resistance, triggering objections. So when I come across somebody who actually gets it, who understands the behavioral aspect of it and human behavior, definitely going to have you on multiple times. So let's do this. I want to dive right into your story and give our listeners a feel for your background and how you arrived at this point where you're one of the elite authorities on sales, on leadership persuasion. Maybe tell us a little bit about your background and how this started for you. Like, how did you learn all these skills, man? Mm -hmm. So definitely, you know, if I look back at my sales career, it has been a windy uphill, downhill road with some boulders along the way. I started selling in college because I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Yeah. And I felt sales was the most secure job I could have. Mm -hmm. Now, not because, you know, there's not a lot of turnover in sales because there's a lot of turnover in sales. It's not very secure. Sure. But companies are always hiring for sales. So I was like, even if I'm bad, like I'll always at least be able to find a job. I mean, like someone will hire me for, for sales, right? And so I started selling knockoff Cutco knives in college. Um, they were called blades with so a Z. So secondhand Cutco. Oh, yeah. They, they the weren't even, 
No, not even man. The ones, man. Not even the not even the real ones where you get actual mentorship and coaching. It was like, of course, the young me, like, ooh, a better commission plan. Let me take that. So, um, yeah, that didn't go very well. Selling door to door knives in in college in Madison, yeah. Wisconsin. So that was my first failure. Mm. Um, then I got into some multi-level marketing. I did a little bit of insurance sales as well. And then when I moved back out to LA, it's when I got my first real mentor. Okay. And this is, this is when I'd say like my sales career changed because, mm. you know, learn it on your own. I think that's why we lose a lot of sa- people in sales because you're, you're forced to learn it on your own, which is the horrible way to try to go through it. Yeah. And so I got a mentor and he, he sat me down and he goes, do you want to be a millionaire? Yeah. So of course I want to be a millionaire. What kind of stupid question is that? <laughs> and he said, okay, so you want, you're sure, you're sure you're willing to put in all the work, all the effort to be a millionaire. I said, yes, like I want to be a millionaire. Teach me how. And he looked at me and said, all right, if I handed you a briefcase with a million dollars in it right now, but you couldn't spend it, mm. would you be happy? I said, well, no, he said, but, but you're a millionaire. You now possess a million dollars. Therefore, you are a millionaire. Why aren't you happy? Yeah. And I was like, well, because I can't spend it. He said, mm-hmm. exactly. So here's the point I'm going for. You don't want to be a millionaire. You want the things that you believe a millionaire will bring you. Wow. Same right. thing when it comes to success. You don't want, you can't be a millionaire yeah. until you act like, behave like, and have the skill sets of a millionaire. Yeah. And then he handed me a book called Think and Grow Rich. He said, go mm-hmm. read this. And that's what started my journey of self-development. And so that I'll stop there because that's what got the, me to the start. And I love that. Well, let's yeah. let's get right into it because with our show, it's a lot about tactical training. It's not about mm-hmm. theory, like theory and motivational stuff. It just wears off, right? If you, it, I mean, mm-hmm. when the prospect picks up the phone on the other line, if you don't know what to say, or more importantly, ask to get them to want to engage with you then all the motivation stuff goes right out the window extremely quickly. So what skills, because I was listening to, for, uh, listening to a few of your podcasts the last couple of days, what skills specifically does someone need that's just starting in sales to become really successful in today's really competitive sales world? I'd say first is tone, mm. how you sound. Right. Like, and when I say, and we can get tactical on tone, like I actually teach different tonalities in my scripts, right. Of like how you need to sound when you're calling. Why is that so important? Because they might have a script with the same questions on it, but one salesperson is able to sell three times as more because they have the right pausing. They have the right verbal pausing. They, they know where to get the prospect to think. Why is that so important? It's how human beings communicate and it's how we establish trust, right? So there's something called tonal um, discongruence, I think is the Mm -hmm. proper tune there, where if you don't sound like Mm -hmm. what you actually are asking for, right? So when you're asking someone for help or you're asking someone for time or you're asking them to make a decision, but you don't sound like you actually need help or you don't sound confident in what you're asking them to do, it creates a distrust in the level you're the distrust in the person you're speaking to at a subconscious level. They don't even recognize it. It activates the reptilian part of the brain where they're like, something's not right here. The person I'm talking to isn't sounding the way I want them to. So now they no longer trust you and they don't even know it yet. So the sales over at hello, right? So if uh, I think you hit it right on the head, the sales not won or lost at the end with, you know, option closes or anything like that. It's now won or lost really within the first couple of minutes of that sales call, right? Because you hit it right on the head. If you're calling your prospects and say, hi, is John there? Hey, John, this is uh, Jane Doe with XYZ Company. And the reason why I'm calling you today is click, right? right? You sound like a robot. You sound like a telemarketer just trying to pitch them something and you've automatically lost trust. Mm-hmm. And it's being prepared to, like a lot of salespeople are just not prepared yet. They haven't even thought about like, what am I actually going to say or how, Whatever, actually, we're, we're on video right now. I have a hat behind me. It's the sales hat. And I have that actually as a reason to like, I tell my reps to take their sales hats off for a second because we as salespeople do things that are really weird yeah. that we would never do or say to a friend. We talk differently. We say things differently. We don't ask good questions. So like knowing what that first 30 seconds is going to be and asking a really good question question yeah. early on so like tactical right another one um this one's from Oren Clough. he wrote pitch anything and um his most recent one flipped the script which is phenomenal yeah. he says you need a status alignment question yeah what's a question you can ask in the first 10 to 15 seconds that establishes 
you're on their level when it comes to what you're talking about and having that ready to go and scripted in a way where it comes alive. That's the key. Yeah. We call that a problem statement with what we do. I, yes. I love that. And you know, one of my good mentors, Jerry uh, Acuff, he talks about in his book that sellers need to stop thinking like sellers, like you said, and start acting like a buyer. And when you start stop thinking like a seller and you're acting like a buyer, you understand from the buyer's point of view, you can help them really persuade themselves yes. that they want what you're offering rather than you trying to use old school, you know, manipulative tactics that just don't work anymore. People are too sophisticated. We live in the information age. And that's, that's where, you know, unfortunately the sales industry got its bad rap is for a long time salespeople were needed for information. That was the only place you could get your information on a new product or a new service was through the salesperson. And because we held the information, a lot of bad apples out there gave bad information out. Well, people expected to be informed about your product or service because 20, even 20 years ago, that was a link between the consumer and, and uh, the, 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 you know, the company was the salesperson, right? Besides like radio or maybe TV ads or direct mail, that's how you learn. You expected to be educated, but you're right. In today's world with the power of the internet and especially social media, we live in a completely different age. Yeah. And this is, you know, we'll go another tactic here that salespeople, I don't think leverage. So like everyone says, you know, the, the buyer now has so much access to information that they never had before. So the buyer has all the power. Okay. So, so do we though, as salespeople, yeah. we also have access to information about their industry, about the trends affecting them, about their company, about the newest updates and releases and things that could have a positive impact on them. But it's like the buyers are out there researching we as sales, it's like we don't become true professionals yeah. of our industry. We try to become professional salespeople versus mm -hmm. being an expert in the industry you are selling to. You have access to information too, go find it. Well, it's all about asking. And when you find that information, it's because one thing we all have to understand is that 95% of your prospects don't even realize that they even have a problem Absolutely. when you first talk to them. You have to under, everybody has to understand that, right? And if they do think that they have a problem, maybe they don't understand what the problem really is or how bad the problem could be if they don't do anything about solving it now, right? So you have to become what we call a problem finder, meaning asking the right questions at the right time in that conversation that get the prospect to realize or find problems in their own mind that they didn't even realize they had. And when you're able to do that, they automatically trust you because they look at you completely different than any other salesperson who's trying to stuff their solution down their throat. They start to look at you as more of the trusted authority. Like you talked about, you quote that book. You're looked at more of an authority figure that's on the same level that they're never gonna go around, even if your prices are way higher, because they're, they're mainly buying on, you know, can this person get me the best result possible? Not this person is the cheapest, but I don't know if I'll get the result. It's a completely different way of thinking. Yeah, absolutely. So we call them gap questions. Mm. Right. Can you ask a question that exposes there might be a gap mm. in their process or their current way of doing things? Right. And the framework of it is, you know, how are you blank yeah. so that blank isn't happening? Right. And that second blank is like a bad thing. Right. So like for say we're talking about, I don't know, sales training. Yeah. Right. It's like, so like how, how are you coaching your sales team right now? So that one, they're not missing out on revenue, but two, that the training actually sticks and doesn't just disappear after 90 days. Like, how are you doing so that So you're right getting now? them to think like, oh, well, we, we have classroom training, but maybe after a few months, they don't remember. You didn't right. say that. You asked a question that allowed them to think that themselves. Right. And it, it, you plant the seed, right? So that it's not fading away after 90 days. Because now they have to think, do I have a way that it's not fading away? And now as a salesperson, no matter what they say, it sets up for the great next question. Because either they're going to say, I guess I don't I really have thought a, about that. Yeah. that. Okay, great. Let's talk about it. Well, we're, we kind of do this. You get to ask another gap question. It's like, oh, well then, okay, but then how do you do this? Or they say, no, we already have it dialed in. Dude, that's amazing. Tell me about that. How are you doing that? And now they get to like spread the ego and sure. the conversation can yeah. continue. So gap questions, that's just a key. Yeah, the larger it. the gap, the more problems that they feel, the more urgency they have to be able to buy now, not later. It's up to you, the salesperson, to be able to create that gap. You can't do it by telling them 
yes. what's wrong. You do it by what you just said, asking questions that allow them to think and find problems they didn't even realize they had. Yeah. Now, what's, what do you think is the biggest hang up that people have in selling, especially when they're starting out? Like what holds them back? What do you think that biggest thing is that holds a lot of people back when they're starting out? Yeah, I think first it's it's confidence, mm -hmm. but I'd say the second is prospect knowledge. Mm. They get really good at the product. Yeah, they're not very good at their prospect. You said it a little bit earlier of like thinking like a buyer. Yeah. Most salespeople, whatever they're selling, most of them haven't ever bought it. Right. Right. Like, and if they did, right, even to like my um, my car salesman on on this this podcast, because I actually I sold cars for a weekend just for for fun. I just wanted to try it. Right. right. Just like, hey, does this carry over? Like, the way you sell a car probably goes completely against how you would want to buy a car. Yeah. And so the it's the prospect knowledge. They think that by knowing the product, yeah, they'll be able to sell. But you need we call to that understand. product pushing. Yes, right. You're just, you're just. Oh, here's the product, and you hope if you say enough of the right things that maybe there's one thing that they like to buy. Versus, how well do you know your prospect? So there's yeah. a great tool. It's called the Buyer's Matrix by Jill Conrath. Mm. It walks through like, okay, for every persona, what are their roles and responsibilities? How are they measured? What does success look like? Who are their peers? Who do they interact with? What are the external challenges that they face? What are the yeah. internal challenges they face? What's their status quo? And here's the big one. What's their change inhibitors? Yeah. What would prevent them from changing if even if they weren't happy? Yeah. If you learn your prospects on that level, mm -hmm. trust me when I say that your product selling will go up. Yeah, and it, it, it's so true because every salesperson, I mean, most salespeople that we come in and train companies, we ask the companies, you know, what, what type of training, like, you know, put me in the shoes of your salespeople. What type of training would I be going through the first couple of weeks? Oh, we've got training. Oh, tell me a little bit more about it. Like, what type of training? Well, we go over the XYZ product and how it does this. Interesting. That tells me one thing, right? So they're, they're teaching product pushing. We're talking about some of the biggest Fortune 500 companies in the world still do this, mm -hmm. okay? So that's like taking a bucket of mud, throwing it up against the wall, like you said, hoping and praying that something you're gonna say is gonna stick in that person's brain and they're just gonna magically want to buy from you. And it's such a hard and unpredictable way to have numbers that you know are gonna come in every month to really make a lot of money as a salesperson. So you've gotta start learning how to become a problem finder and a problem solver to think that way not a product pusher. Now, that leads me into this next question. What are your thoughts on closing and closing techniques? So, I, well, I, I don't know if it's gonna be controversial or not. I, we want it to be controversial. All right, Should the, the, the close to me is the easiest part of the sale. Yeah. Closing is simply asking a question, right? That's all, it's all it is. So anyone out there listening that wants to be a, a closer, I love that term. All, all you have closer. to right, like you, you ask the question, you going to buy today? There we go. Okay. So now we all know how to try to close a, a deal. Will you buy? Are you ready to get started? Like, are there ways to ask it? Yes. But the close is simple, which is, and you, I know, you know, this, the amount of reps that actually still don't ask for the sale yeah. is mind blowing to me. And, and we get to the end and we hope they will close themselves. We put all the pressure on the buyer. Again, back to like understand the buyer. We want them to go, okay, how do I buy? From a decision-making process, that's way too much pressure and fear to the buyer. And so they won't say it. So closing, just ask for the sale. It's yeah. setting up the close yeah. that is hard. It's discovering the problems, yeah. looping back throughout the presentation, justifying the reason to make the decision, taking away the risks and the fears and tying it back to their why. Why do they want to change this? That's the hard That's part the close, of the close actually happens during the discovery process of For that sure. caller meeting. Yes. The, the close at the very end, you know, in, in traditional selling, like the AIDA model of selling, right? Attention, okay. interest, desire, action. 30% of that sales process is the close. Do you want the red one or the blue one? Do you want it delivered Wednesday or Thursday? It's like all this, just the puppy dog close, the Benjamin Fane close. That stuff is so old school, especially if you're selling more of a complex selling environment that you're going to get laughed out of the room if you use it. It's that bad, okay? Yeah. So it's a simple, uh, you know, what we call commitment question. We don't even use the word closing because it sounds so 
just who wants to be closed now right want to commit them to take the next step to solve their problems and purchase the solution so they don't stay in status quo forever yes, yes. so we're yes. going to ask a commitment question you know just something like this with this type of tonality so john do you do you feel like this could be the answer for you oh yeah we did well hold on why do you why do you feel like it is though right probing right so it's just a simple closing it's a simple yeah. commitment question it's like literally two percent of the sales process okay so you just did something there that one that I teach, I don't hear a lot of other people teach, right? Like I don't try to close someone who isn't sold. Yeah. Right. And you checked to see if they were sold. Hey, prospect, do you think this is going to solve X, Y, Z problem? Cause if not, like, I don't even need to go into pricing. Like if you don't even think this is going to solve it. Right. And then you nailed it though. They say, well, yeah, I do. Why? Why do you feel like it would though? Who's selling like who now? They're, they're, they're selling back to you. And that's where the law of consistency comes in is now when it's coming from them, they have to remain consistent with that belief and that statement. So now it's like, well, okay, can I make a recommendation to get you started, get you one step closer to achieving what you're trying to do? Yeah, would do you, you like, like the red, is, red or the blue? Then you yeah. can do the red or the blue, right? Yeah, do you feel like this is something you can, yeah, exactly. The setup somewhere. Do you feel like this is something you can do to, to really get your company where you're wanting to go oh yeah for sure well hold on why why though or why is it so important to you now though or if you get jedi skills eventually you can say well what well why now why why not just wait and do it later now be careful on that one you have to be like jedi mm -hmm. like you have to really understand the sales process before you ask that question but that question works really well with uh big companies that are very skeptical well, well why now though why not just do it later well we have to do it now because of this and this and like you said they just told themselves why they have to do it now. They're never going to come back in two minutes from now and say, well, I think we're going to think it over or wait six months. And that's where, why, you know, I said earlier that that process of like risk mitigation, but also unselling the status quo of now, you've already removed the option of staying the same, right? Your goal throughout the demo or the pitch is to get them to agree to change. It's not to get them to buy your product. It's to get them to agree. They have to make a change. Selling is all about change. Right. Now that six month is not an option. Well, we're going to wait six months. Whoa, 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 hold on. Hold on. Jeremy, you, you told me that every month that goes by with your sales team below X percentage, yeah. you're losing a million dollars in ARR. So how much money are you going to lose every month for the next six months? If you don't address this problem right. now, that's six. Are you sure? And this is where you get to go. Are you sure that's going to cost $6 million and you already know that. Are you sure that's what you want to do? Are you willing right? to settle for that? Yeah. Okay. Now everyone that's here, let's listen to this is hearing um, Jeremy and I riff. I hope you're hearing our tones too. We can't help, but get into the right tone. We can't help, but like get into the inquisitive, the whole down, the wait a minute. Like if y'all could see us, our hands are moving, the chin comes in, right? Like yeah, it's all those that. things like the back full circle of the tone, everything we're saying, it doesn't work. If you take that old school bullish, like, well, Mr. Prospect, that's going to cost you $6 million. Everyone who read the challenger sale thinks that challenger selling was challenging them. That's, I like not, that. what a, that's not what a challenger sale is. It's challenging the status quo yeah. through with insights, the, through education. With questions, not statements. Yes. You turn that statement into a question, it gets them to realize that, not you telling them that. You tell them it's going to go in one ear, out the other, right? Because it's coming from you. If you ask the question and they tell themselves, well, now it's coming from them. And it, it mm -hmm. seems like a pretty good idea if it's coming from them, right? 100%. Yes. Now, let's talk about this. This is a, this is a great interview. What, what's a reason? So right now, what, what do you think is the main reason why so many buying decisions are stalling in the marketplace? Oh, fear. Yeah. Absolutely. It's fear. And I think this is also something that salespeople don't take into consideration. Yeah. Right? If someone was not afraid, uh -huh. would it stall? if they weren't afraid, if they weren't unsure of yeah. something, mm. right? And also too, back to it, to sell someone something new, uh -huh. you need to unsell them on what they have. Yeah, their way of so, thinking. Right, if you are only selling a better future, 
our product will make you more money, save you more time, speed up this, slow down this, whatever. And you're only selling a better future. Mm -hmm. That's why things stall because you never addressed the problem of the now, yeah. right? If, if we were in a, a conference hall right now, we had 500 people in that, that stage room and we stood up and we said, hey, raise your hand. Yeah. If you have ever stayed in a relationship longer than you should have, even though you knew you should have gotten out, how many hands go up? Everybody everybody's hands. Now that is a relationship that you knew you should have gotten out to. You had the social proof. There were other things to look at. Your friends were telling you to leave. You were unhappy. There were other options available. There's an upgrade across the street, <laughs> right. but you stay and you stay because it's safe. Yeah. You stay because it's comfortable. You stay because you're unsure of what's out there until yeah. you can make the now uncomfortable. And this is, I like to use the word uncomfortable over pain because salespeople love to go like, go the pain, right? I'm going to find the pain and stick the pain and poke the, no, yeah. but you have to unsell them on the now. So if any deal is stalling, it means mm. you didn't unsell them on what they are doing now. And that's why it's sticking. You didn't find out what their real problems were. You probably asked surface level questions that are all logical based and they give you a logical answer. Like never use this question. Oh, so John, what's keeping you awake at night? Blah. Never <laughs> stop. use that question. <laughs> Please stop. Just Stop it. If you say that to somebody, they are just going to immediately put you in the salesperson zone. And you never want to be in the salesperson. It's like if you're dating and they put you in the friend zone. It's just a zone you don't want to be in. The worst word you could ever you could hear from a prospect is, oh, wow, you can sell anything. Because those people never buy from you because they feel like they're being sold. Right? You never want to hear those words. So buying decisions right now, or like you said, are delayed, especially because of the pandemic. So a lot of companies that used to think, two, three, four years out planning for that are now planning what's going to happen in the next 90 days, right? Because there's so much uncertainty. So you have to be extra, extra good at asking the right questions that help build urgency in that sale to prevent them from, like you said, not solving their problem, staying in the status quo and nothing ever changes. What's, what do you think, what's a good question that you would ask that helps build urgency in the sale? Like what, what would be a good question for a salesperson to really ask a prospect to help create urgency? What happens if you don't? Mm, consequence question. Right. What happens if you don't fix this? Yeah. What changes if you don't fix this? Mm. Right. That's like, an, see how easy that question is, but how psychologically powerful it is. Right. That it's getting them, you know, the old school um, sales tactic, right? You, you get them to hold it right? For all my in-person salespeople selling gizmos and gadgets, right? If you can get them to hold it, they're significantly less likely to ever give it back, right? It's part of the sale. When we're selling over the phone or face-to-face, -face, getting them to hold it is getting them to say it, yeah. right? So it's like, hey, so, okay. So we noticed this, we kind of spotted this, like what, what happens if you don't fix this? Like what are the, what are, what are the possible ramifications if your company doesn't do anything to address this? Right? right? It's the same thing that you just said. It's just a consequence. Right? You're getting them to think about the potential consequences if they don't do anything about it. I love those. Those are perfect. Well, I hope everybody wrote down yeah. what he just said. And, and the beauty there, right, too, it's not the potential consequences. Yeah. It's the real consequences because yeah. until they do buy from you, that is their reality. Yeah. And so it's not even a potential. It's like, yo, so by not fixing this, you told me this is going to happen. Is that the reality that what you want? And do? then back to it, right? We talk about fear. Okay. And we talk about this even my own team. I can, I'm not a fortune teller. Yeah. I can't tell you what the future is going to hold. Yeah. I can tell you if you make no changes. What are you going to do? Nothing changes. Yeah. When it gets to the end of the buy, right? It's a commitment. As human beings, where it's so funny. We love security, but we hate commitment. Right. We love novelty, but we fear change. Mm. Right. This is the dichotomy of being a human being. We are a very interesting creature. So it gets to the end and now they're afraid of that commitment. Yeah. What you're trying to get them to do though is realize what they are committing to if they don't do something. So it's like people ask for guarantees. People ask for all this. It's like, Hey, look, there's two routes we can go here. By the way, this is called an either, or they're going to have to pick a side. Either you stay the same. Yeah. And I know, what that's going to look like. Yeah. I know I can actually guarantee in six months from now, yeah. these are the results that you'll be seeing. I know that. Yeah. Or you can try to make a change. Yeah. Now, six months later, maybe 
nothing else changed. Mm. All you did was waste a little bit of money. Yeah. But one side you're actually doing something and one side you're not. Yeah. Which side do you want to be on? Which is more risky? Doing right. nothing and staying in the status quo right. or changing your situation so that you can repeat back what they said they wanted. Right. And then that's where you then get to go and give them some proof to say, hey, look, like I have customers or I have people. Like, do you think they're paying me because I'm ripping them off? Yeah. Do you think I have, like, you know, for you, do you think I've trained all these Fortune 500 companies because I went in there and no impact was had and everybody hated it? Like, sure. come on, Jeremy, like let's, let's yeah. do this together and I'll guide right. you along the way. Let's talk about virtual selling or remote selling. Obviously that's going on right now with the pandemic. What are you seeing as some of the biggest challenges to selling virtually and remotely right now for salespeople? The biggest, biggest right now is actually getting in touch with people mm. because you got to remember the entire sales data and intelligence agency was about how to get in touch with them at the office. Just shoot, man, 70% of people are working from home right now. And so now you're like, one, you don't maybe have their cell phone. And if you don't have their cell, or if you do have your cell phone, it's still a tricky line sometimes. Like you're, you're hitting someone up on their personal cell phone to make a cold call. There's, you're already going in with less trust because they're like, wait a minute, who is this call in my phone? Sure. So I guess call, luckily for me, I've been virtual selling for the past 10 years. Yeah. Like I got out of that door to door life. I got out of the, the traveling and the face to face. Sure. I actually preferred inside. Um, I, as much as I love meeting people face to face and you can read them and you can transfer emotion and you can bring energy inside selling, I can be whoever I want. Yeah. I can have my notes in front of me. I can have my script in front of me. I can do yeah. the things I can reach out to more people. So access, access has been far and away the biggest shift over this, you know, kind of COVID period is it's harder to get in touch with yeah. people to then even start the sales process. Yeah. You have to, you, especially cold calling, you have to learn what we call our problem statements that when you call them rather than going, hi, my name is, I'm with, and what we do is like every salesperson says, click, we're not interested, we don't need it, call me back in a month. You have to learn how to ask what we call the problem statement that goes over one or two problems that anybody picking up the phone can identify with. That creates curiosity where they're almost forced to want to engage because they're so curious about the problem that you just brought up. So important, especially right now during the pandemic. Now, let's talk about what you do. When you're training salespeople, can you describe your prospect, really your prospects that you teach them and why it's so effective? Like, why does it work so well for duplication? Um, I think the, if I look at why I think it works well, one, it's based off people, right? So like what I tell like my reps when they come in is like, I'm not trying to make you a good patient pop salesperson or a good service titan or good snap. I'm just trying to make you a great salesperson. Yeah. And it's not B to B. It's not B to C. Yeah. It's, it's B to H or B to P. It's people that you sell to. And so that's where we focus a lot of our time is one, I want my salesperson to be a person, yeah. talk like a person, be curious yeah, like being. a person, yeah. care like a person, right? Like that's the first part is like, I teach it in a way where a lot, you mentioned it earlier, like a lot of the old school, like selling tactics are, they make the salesperson uncomfortable. Like we wonder why they're not good at it. Cause when you're telling someone to be this alpha dog, bulldog, bum rush salesperson, it doesn't feel good exactly. or to be sleazy. It doesn't feel good to lie. It doesn't. So that's the first part is I teach them for, as a person also too, I've spent a lot of time learning about learning. Yeah. Like, how do people learn, yeah. which we, we forget. And so I think another reason some I do differently from most people I know, like leading orgs right now is the amount of repetition my reps go through. Mm. We do so much practice, like so much practice to get better. Right. I don't know if you played sports. Did you play sports growing I up? Did, at all? I played college baseball. College. Ooh. Okay. What was your, what was your position? I played as well. Center field. Center. I used to be half what somewhat fast. Let's go center field right here too. Okay. So you played all the way to collegiate, right? How long is a baseball game? Nine innings. Nine innings. How many at bats do you get in that nine inning game? Typically three to four. Three to four in a game, right? And how many hits will you get in that game? Well, if you're good, if you're above average, let's say that your batting average is 330. So okay. you're going to get one out of three hits. Right. Now for those four at bats in that game, how many swings did you take in your life 
to get there. <laughs> yeah, thousands, right? Okay. I mean, you're, you're in the upper hundreds of thousands. How many hours a week did you practice for that nine inning game? Oh, yeah. I mean, in the summer, we played, you know, 80 games just in the summers. Okay. Just in the summer. And then you had practice and you had drills. You never stopped hitting off the tee. This is my number one piece of advice to salespeople is we don't practice enough. 100%. My teams do. So like they are role playing and role playing and chunking and making sure they get it down. And then the flip side of it is focused on the person we're selling to. Yeah. It's very light on product, very heavy on person and problem. Yeah. You're, it, 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 it's heavy on the person, the problems, and really what their so, you know, gap future state is or their future objectives, where they really want to go. It's those things for sure. And I see it all the time. It's like, it's like an athlete, like you just talked about, like LeBron James, you know, just won his fourth championship or Tom Brady, you know, six rings now. They're always practicing. They always have a coach. They're always learning new skills because, and that's why they're the best. Salespeople, you know, I read an, an article um, in Forbes the other day and it says the average salesperson in North America spends less than a hundred dollars a year on sales training. And I don't even know if that sales training they spent a hundred bucks on is any good. That's the problem. And then we wonder why we're not making 200,000 a year as a salesperson or 300 or 400 or whatever we want to make. If you don't learn the right skills, if you don't learn the advanced yeah. skills, do you think you're just going to wing it and somehow get yeah. lucky magically? Dude, dude I, I tell this to people all the time. I was like, if salespeople dedicated even half the amount of time to their career as they did their high school sport or a band or a hobby, yeah. they would be making multiple six figures. I'm talking about right? 30 minutes a day. It's not even right. that much. Right. For like people spend hours a day on their cell phones, on video games, on word with friends, on Farmville, watching TV in high school, you were practicing 10 hours a week for that one hour game to get your little letters. So you can walk down the hall with the medals jingling. Like, and then we get into sales, clock out, pour a drink, go home and then complain about the leads. Yeah. Complain about the leads and complain about you can't pay your bills. You don't have what you want. It's all up to you to learn the advanced skills. The advanced skills are out there. I mean, there's people like you, there's people like me, there's, there's people like others we bring on the show. The advanced skills are out there that work with human behavior. You just have to go out there, invest in those skills, and then really learn those skills and do it over and over and over where it's almost like you're repeating what Katie just said the way he said it. It's almost like you become KD, you become Jeremy. It's like you're using the same tonality when you're talking to your spouse or your kids or anybody. And it becomes like really who you are as a person, mm -hmm. not just something you do. And that comes from practice. I said this actually on stage a couple of years ago. Like, I don't know if you do this, but I get on stage and I talk and I black out. I totally forget what I say. And then I get to hear it back the next time and go, oh, that was, all right, that was good. Or, Ooh, what was I thinking? Yeah. Um, and, I, and I said this, I said, the, the best practice on purpose, the rest practice on prospects. Because if you're not practicing on purpose, if you don't have Jeremy on the phone or a manager on the phone and you're actually practicing it, like getting better, you're practicing on the prospect. So like if you go and hear what we're saying today and go, ooh, I like that line. I'm gonna go do that on my next sales call. Please don't, please yeah. don't do that. Cause like now you're practicing with real money. You're practicing with the prospect. Take 30 minutes, call your friend, your brother, your mother, whatever, and say, hey, I just need to say this 30, 40 times until it sounds natural. Here's what people also forget about learning. You know how many times you have to say something out loud before it sounds natural? How many times? You have to say it almost 175 times out loud before it sounds natural yeah. to you. Yeah. Before it sounds natural to you, you have to say it out loud 175 times. Yeah. Now, people listening might think that's a lot, yeah. but 30 minutes. Hey, Jeremy, this is KD over at Patient Pop. Man, I was just on your website. I was, I was hoping I could ask you a couple quick questions. Do you got a second? Hey, Jeremy, this is KD over at Patient Pop. You know, I was just on your website. I was hoping I could ask you a couple quick questions. Do you got a second? If I did that for 30 minutes straight, you know how many times I could get that said? Yeah. I'm almost there already. Yeah. That's all it takes to get that tone and the action down. It, it, the, the tone is so important. We talked, that was one of the first things we talked about. It's that same, let's say we ask a commitment question like I talked about. Like, do you, do you feel like this could be the, the answer for you? It's that tone, it's that verbal pause right there that makes it special. Now, on the flip side, if I'm just starting out and I take that question and I go today, John, do you feel like this could be the answer for you? It's the same question, but it implies something. I mean, it's just a completely mm -hmm. different meaning and you'll get a completely yes. different response from the prospect. You're asking yes. the same question. It's just how you're asking it. Yes, absolutely. It, confidence comes from repetition, yeah. right? Like I think Tony Robbins said it, right? Repetition is the mother of skill. 
right? And skill is the father of mastery. Yeah. Like you just got to put your reps in y'all, but do it intentionally. Don't do it haphazardly. Don't do it with the prospect. Put it in intentionally. Take pride in what you do. We got to be prideful as salespeople. Like, man, like this is the best career out there. There's no other career that provides this level of pay with this level of call it flexibility without call it education. Yeah. But you got to, you got to take pride in it. You got to yeah. mean to do this well. You, you treat it like Tom Brady teaches, you know, you know, it was about football. You treat it how LeBron James treats basketball. You, you, you treat it like, you know, Tiger Woods treats golf. If you want to become the best, if you want to be recognized, if you want to make the money you want for your family, all you have to do is learn the right skills. It's not rocket science. You're not born with those skills. Nobody's born just mm -hmm. knowing what questions to ask at the right time that work with human behavior. You just, or you learn them from the right people. That's all you got to do. Hey, can't thank you enough for joining us here. This was an awesome show. Do you have any final thoughts or advice for our listeners before we go? Yeah, I, I think it's just the underlying theme of, I think what we've been talking about this whole time is one, invest in yourself, learn, read, buy courses, listen to podcasts, like invest in your skill set. Then the second part is practice it. Put in the time and effort to get good at what you do. And the last part is be a person that's selling to a person. Remember that at the end of the day, it was like, you are a person, so take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Remember you're talking to a person. That person has the same fears, insecurities, doubts, weaknesses, goals, dreams that probably you do. Yeah. Sell to that, yeah. your results will go up. Yeah, I love that. You're really, you're not just selling to the why, because most people can sell to the why. You're selling what's behind the why. That's the key if you want to be the very best in your industry, selling behind what, behind the why, not just the why, but what's behind that why. I love that. Katie, where can our listeners learn more about you and your training? Uh, for sure. So uh, you can follow me on LinkedIn. I don't have any of the other social channels yet. So no Snap or Twitter, the Gram or TikTok, what other kids are on now. So LinkedIn there. Um, I do have a Patreon group as well, where I do like more like live trainings and coaching sessions and webinars and things like that for people. So it's called Inside Sales Excellence on Patreon. But yeah, LinkedIn or Patreon, they can come find me and reach out. Like I love to give feedback. I love to help in any way. I love my salespeople, man. I love them. And yeah, if, it, if we can help them be better, man. Yeah, 100%. Follow, follow uh, KD on LinkedIn. Awesome. I mean, he just gave you some huge, massive golden nuggets today. I hope you're paying attention. I hope you wrote down some of those questions he gave you because those are going to massively help you once you learn everything around that. Not just one or two questions, but the whole sales process. KD, thanks for being on. It was awesome. Yeah, thanks for having me. If you're serious about joining the top 1%, I mean the top 1%, and you want to experience more training content just like this, Click the links right over there. Right over there, they're exactly what you need to see next. You see, I release new episodes featuring top salespeople and sales authorities, multiple six-figure, high six-figure, even seven-figure earners every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday every single week at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you're new here, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button right below right below and join our new Facebook group, Sales Revolution. You see, it's free and there's a link in the description below just for you. We put it there for you. Finally, I make posts on Facebook and Instagram each and every day with more tips and training. So be sure and follow me and turn on your notifications. So make a comment in the first seven minutes to any of my latest posts, share this episode, and there's a very real chance that you're gonna win some killer prizes. And here's the thing, don't sit on the sidelines. Don't be like everyone else. Get into the game. Join the sales revolution. Stay active, get involved, learn the right skills, and we will show you how to take your life and income to a level that most only dream about. Stay safe. Talk to you soon.